the space, the length of our intestines is actually the same as a tennis court. Uh, so, you know, when we're watching the Australian Open, for example, that tennis court is inside of us and it's only one cell thick. So any, anything that can kind of get through that, you know, thin, thin, thin membrane, our immune system goes, oh my gosh, you know, we're under attack. And we need, we need all the energy that you have to fight this war that you may not even feel. Now, most people feel it by, you know, fatigue or, you know, other, believe it or not, I see so many, particularly women uh, with depression and anxiety, and they don't have a clue, unfortunately, that this is actually happening uh, because of this war that's starting down in their gut. You guys uh, have taught me so much, women, <laughs> um, because you guys thankfully have a gut feeling and mm. men and quite frankly, most medical people have poo-pooed that feeling that women have. Uh, luckily, I have a wife, two daughters and three female dogs. So um, <laughs> I, I, I have Fashion. A, yeah, well, yeah, and luckily I, I've learned that you know, women have this you know, sense uh, that we should pay attention to. And for the last 20 years, I've been urging women in particular to please keep looking for a healthcare provider who will take your complaints seriously. And once people start doing that, once I started saying, gee, you know, that's, uh, are you sure that that's going on? And I started looking at the blood work and I go, oh, son of a gun, you know, you're right. Um, and let's fix it. Mm. I mean, I'm, I can completely attest to that. I, I think that maybe what could be said is not only to find a practitioner that takes you seriously and is willing to uh, explore what it is that could be causing this, um, what some may think is imaginary symptom, right. um, but also to you yourself, that person out there to take your symptoms seriously, to take your intuition seriously, probably 2018. I remember thinking to myself, like my body had shifted a little, like, like gained a couple of pounds out of nowhere. And I was like, man, this is so weird. And nothing I did made a dent on it. And I was like, Maybe it's just, I need to try harder. Maybe it's just age. Maybe it's just that. But my intuition said my hormones are off. I probably should check them. Fast forward now into the end of 2020, I had another shift like that. And I was like, okay, this is not okay anymore. And I'm one of those people that does have great energy. And so um, it's not as easily uh, noticed in my world. Um, but then I finally went in and I had a slew of things, including leaky gut, including dysbiosis, including heavy metal toxicity. I mean, just tons and tons of stuff. Thankfully, I felt decent, but you know, the ultimate shift for me was I, I finally had cycle issues. And then I was like, well, I guess I should probably do something about this. Um, so I think that yes, following that intuition and getting in touch with the body and trusting that is a really important thing. So um, do you find that food is the number one culprit? Yeah. Um, you know, Hippocrates also said, you know, let food be thy medicine and <laughs> medicine be thy food. He was smart. <laughs> Man, I don't know how he figured all this out, but yeah. So that's, I guess what made me famous is that a lot of the healthy foods that we think are good for us actually contain, um, mischievous little proteins that are the defense system of the plant against being eaten, which are called lectins. And mm -hmm. lectins um, bind to the wall of our gut and they actually flip a switch that breaks these tight junctions. Mm -hmm. And the object of the game for a plant is not to be eaten mm -hmm. and to make sure that its babies don't get it eaten its seeds. And their only defense against being eaten is to try and make their predator, in that case us, not feel well when we eat certain plants or plant babies. And the object of the game is a smart animal 
if it doesn't feel well, or if it's not thriving, or even if it's not reproducing, the animal says, you know, uh, every time I eat this plant or this plant baby, I don't feel very well. I think I'll go eat something else. Mm -hmm. The plant wins, the animal wins, everybody's happy. Humans, as we all know, are pretty stupid. And so when we eat things that we have an intuition or we can feel that eh, something's not right, we take, you know, we take Prilosec OTC or Tums or Nexium. Uh, we take antidepressants. We take uh, Aleve, Advil. And this actually, as I write in all my books, makes things worse rather than better. The other thing that I think is really important that I wrote in the last book, particularly, is uh, we have amazing gut dysbiosis now just because uh, of two things. Number one, the antibiotics that we take uh, for whatever. Um, you couldn't believe the number of people who have been given antibiotics for COVID-19, which they don't work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a virus, folks. Um, Number two, antibiotics are fed to almost all of our conventionally farmed animals. And we use them to make these animals grow quicker and faster and fatter. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we eat these animals, uh, we actually are eating the antibiotics that are in their flesh. And so unbeknownst to us, those antibiotics kill off our gut microbiome. So rather than having this intense, beautiful, diverse, uh, tropical rainforest of tens of thousands of species of bacteria in our gut, many of us, for instance, after a course of antibiotics, um, you may be reduced to one or two bacteria out of 10,000. And it may take two to three years to get that back. <gasps> no, and, don't say that. Yeah, it's unfortunately true. Uh, I mean, think about it. If, if a forest burns down and we yeah. run in there and we plant little seedlings, it's going to take 20 or 30 years to get that forest back. And so we've been really naive that Oh, I can take, you know, some probiotics the next day and I'll be back to normal. And fortunately, you got to build this ecosystem in your gut. Oh, man, that's yeah. uh, that's sad to hear, because like as a current issue, I have, like I said, dysbiosis and leaky gut. And of course, that stuff doesn't get tested like monthly. But, you know, I've heard and and please explain explain this to me and, and help us understand that your like your face is basically like the inside out of your gut. Is that True. accurate? Mm -hmm. That's accurate. Great. Well, my gut sucks right now and thank God for makeup, but I have, um, and I got this like 10 years ago, it's perioral dermatitis or something like that. And it basically looks like a little rash, right? It's like little bumps around your face. And I mm -hmm. got it last summer when all of this got tested and then I was running a marathon. So I was training a ton and I've heard that marathons are bad for leaky gut and gut issues. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. It's, yes. one, of, it's one of the worst things you can do for your health. No offense. I agree. And I was invited to do another one with the girls that did it with me. And I said, absolutely not, but I will cheer you on. Problem is though, is what do you do about it? So like in my situation, I tried to avoid antibiotics. I had a topical steroid. I used it for the last six months. And then I heard it could actually have a, a bad payoff. Like it makes things worse. Is that true too? Well, yeah, topical steroids, I mean, they cover up the problem, but you're right. So What's fascinating is the, the lining of our gut is literally our skin turned inside out. And so what's fascinating is what's happening on the inside wall of your gut, in a way, luckily for many people, is expressed on their skin. And mm. so people with psoriasis, people with eczema, people with dermatitis, mm -hmm. those are actually an external sign that that process is going on on the inside of your gut. So if you think about this, you know, red raw rash, yeah. you go, 
oh my gosh, I got, <laughs> I got this red rawness on the inside of my gut and I don't want that. Let's say, let's say you can just let's say, let's say you're someone who can see it on your skin. Maybe, you know, I've heard of a lot of people have, um, you know, avoid gluten or dairy and that also helps clear their skin up, things like that. So if you're someone out there and you can see it on your skin that something's going on, what do you do? And in this case, like for even something like what I have going on, the, the general fix usually is an antibiotic, right? I hope not, but oh. uh, well, it, what do we do? Well, so uh, again, this is a sign that the wall of your gut is is under attack by compounds that produce these gaps in the wall of your gut. Mm -hmm. And uh, about eighty percent of all my patients now uh, have an autoimmune disease that have been kind of all around the country or the world trying to fix because they don't want to go on immunosuppressant drugs or they're on them and want to get off. Mm -hmm. And so we, we do have the benefit of testing people for leaky gut. And we also have the benefit of testing people for food sensitivities. Mm -hmm. And what's fascinating is years ago, we used to do food allergy testings where we put right. like a hundred little pinpricks on your back yep. and see what you reacted to. They're worthless. Um, really? Oh yeah. They're worthless. Oh. I guess one of the reasons I might be believable is I'm willing to say I was wrong uh, based on new data. And yeah, I used to use this, these tests and they're useless because we now have much better tests uh, looking at what are called food sensitivities. If you have a porous wall of your gut, if you have intestinal permeability. Normally, the foods we eat should be broken down by all of our digestive enzymes into simple sugars, simple amino acids from protein, and simple fatty acids from fat. And those should be absorbed through the wall of our gut. But if you've got spaces, gaps, then whole pieces of food that were not broken down properly can actually go across the wall of our gut. So let me give you an example. Um, let's suppose you eat a lot of kale and then we do a food sensitivity test and all of a sudden you react very strongly to kale. And you go, well, what the heck? You know, that's not right. You know, I eat a lot of kale and kale's good for me. Right. Well, what happens is if a whole piece of kale comes across the wall of your gut, your immune system says, what the heck is that? I've never, I've never seen kale before. You know, I've seen simple carbohydrates. That's a foreign protein. That's a foreign body. And I'm going to attack it. And so it's fascinating. Years ago, when we first had these tests, uh, I'll, I'll backtrack for a second. About 90% of people who get my book, The Plant Paradox, or one of the subsequent ones, resolve their autoimmune disease with just by following, don't eat these foods. And, you know, it's exciting um, that that Amazing. works. But about 10% of people, and even 10% of my patients, despite swearing on Bibles or Qurans or whatever, that they're following the rules, they're, they're better, but they're not all the way better. And so when we do that, then we go more sophisticated looking for food sensitivities. And I can tell you as a general rule, and I wrote this in my first, in the plant paradox, 70% of people with celiac disease, which is the extreme form of gluten intolerance, mm -hmm. A year and a half after following a gluten-free diet still have celiac disease by intestinal biopsy, which is the gold standard. Why? Because most gluten-free foods have lectins that they are reacting to beyond gluten. So 70% of people who are sensitive to wheat are sensitive to corn. 100% of people who are sensitive to wheat are sensitive to oats, including gluten-free oats. Um, they're sensitive to quinoa. They're sensitive to buckwheat. They're sensitive to almost all the pseudo grains, and they literally cross-react. 
The other thing that's unique in my troublemaking patients, as I call them, is most of them are sensitive to not only casein A1, which I write about, but also casein A2. Those are the milks, right? Those, those are, are the milks. Kinds of cows, right? Yeah, those are the two different kinds of cows. And most of the really sensitive people are sensitive to egg white and egg yolk. Uh, sorry. Now, yeah, the good news is, and then we do a food sensitivity, and quite frankly, almonds show up all the time. Um, when I first did this years ago, we banned almonds. But when I wrote The Plant Paradox, my editor said, man, you're really mean. Come on, give it, you know, give us something. <laughs> and I said, OK, the, the lectin is in the peel of the almond. So you can have blanched almond flour and you can have Marcona almonds. And it's worked pretty well. But again, some of my troublemakers, it's almond flour that's the, the trouble. And when we get rid of that, it's, it's all better. I, I'll give you a great example. Um, uh, as an athlete, um, a couple of years ago, I had an uh, NHL hockey player, young man, 23 years old, who developed Crohn's disease, which is, a, is an autoimmune. And he was having 20 episodes of bloody diarrhea a day. And he was on two immunosuppressants and wasn't getting any better. Uh, he had to drop out of the NHL. He lived with his mother and I, he, he lost 75 pounds. He was a skeleton. And somebody gave him my book, The Plant Paradox, and he started following it. And he got down to about, oh, three to four bloody bowel moves a day, but he, his weight stabilized. So get a cold call from him and said, hey, you know, this is the first thing that has actually worked, but I'm not all the way yet. Could we, you know, investigate this further? And I said, yeah, you know, this would be great. So we did all this and sure enough, uh, he was sensitive to all forms of dairy and all forms of eggs and you know, gluten was a disaster and so was corn, et cetera. So we took all those away from him. And in three months, he's back having normal bowel movements and he's gaining weight. And he still, still his, he don't, wasn't having bloody bowel moons, but he says, you know, they're still not formed right. I said, okay, let's, let's do a food sensitivity. And he was having a lot of almond flour bread, almond flour cookies. And sure enough, almond flour and vanilla beans were a couple of his real troublemakers. And so we took them away and he, he calls me back, his mother, and he called me back. So that was it. That was it. He's back to normal and he's back playing now. And so, oh my God, but it was oh. like son of a gun such an investigation. It takes so long. I mean, even I can attest to that. You think it's this and then that kind of doesn't work and you go to that and the next thing and the next thing, and you kind of just peel away the layers of like, what is really the thing? And it, it takes time. So when you execute it, it's like, good job. Like that's hard to do. Oh, it's very hard to that, do. And the fact that your book can do it, on its own without actually having to, I mean, this is the ultimate scaling option for someone like you who has this information to be able to write a book to help people because you can't possibly see all the patients that read this book. I still see patients six days a week because uh, it's, it's very hard for me um, to turn people down, uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, the, the, I mean, the heartwarming stories I can tell, like, like this fellow, but I mean, we had a little uh, five-year-old child uh, from Texas who's had just his entire palms of his hands and of his feet were just bloody and he couldn't walk. Uh, his mother carried him around all of his life and he'd been everywhere and he couldn't go to school because, I mean, literally his hands were bleeding and his, his feet were bleeding and, you know, people would put him on steroids, blah, blah, blah. And nothing was working. And she wrote me a letter. And, you know, I said, Oh, my gosh, you know, let's see what's going on. Well, this poor young man had just profound leaky gut in a very low vitamin D level. And hopefully we can talk about that. And long story short, it took us a year. But 
uh, he completely healed his hands and feet. The mother would, you know, send me photographs and we'd talk mm -hmm. every three months and we found, you know, what he was sensitive to. And now he's, oh, I think he's uh, nine years old in school, thriving in advanced classes and mom doesn't have to carry him around anymore. That's, you know, and so how can I resist, you know, you know, I have to keep seeing patients because they teach me. Mm. What do you say, just to clean it up, because I know a lot of people that have done uh, a food sensitivity test, um, and it seems like a lot of times the things that show up on it are the things you eat. Correct. So how accurate is the test itself? And is there a certain gold standard of a company that tests? Like, is there a hierarchy if you just sign up for the one where they send you a box and do the thing, like prick your finger a bit? Like, is that enough or do you need to go to a certain level to achieve accurate results? And the fact that so many things show up on your diet that is what you eat, is that because it's truly aggravating you? Or so, yeah, uh, it, there's a lot of questions there, but uh, I personally use a lab called vibrant america i've mm -hmm. used lots of labs to me they're the most accurate mm -hmm. um the and it you know it's gonna cost you to get the the full panel it's gonna cost you about 400 500 bucks uh there are other labs that do them uh cyrex is another one that's quite good but i like vibrant better um your point is well taken. If you're eating a lot of things and you have leaky gut, invariably these things you are going to be sensitized to. Now, the good news, it may take me, somebody else, a year to get somebody's leaky gut sealed. Mm -hmm. I was naive when I started this. I said, ah, a couple of weeks, you'll be fine. <laughs> no. But the good news is once you seal leaky gut, we find that you become desensitized against most of these foods. In fact, I gave a paper at the American Heart Association Lifestyle and Epidemiology meeting two years ago showing that 94% of people who had celiac disease and profound gluten intolerance in a year, 94% of them no longer had any antibodies to gluten. Their immune system literally was retrained that gluten was not an issue for them anymore. So, I mean, the extent, we find that once you seal the gut by removing these things, and once you, you literally can retrain the immune system not to react to these substances. And that's why uh, so many of my patients, if I can convince them that, yeah, I'm going to make you miserable and the foods I'm going to take away from you, but if we seal your gut, and most of the time we can, we'll get these things back into your diet mm -hmm. and, and it'll be worth it long term. Mm -hmm. Wow. So essentially the like testing for food sensitivities, given the fact that yes, the things that you eat show up in your diet, because of course, like you said, it passes through particles that are way too big. Your body doesn't right. understand it. It hasn't been broken down. So it's really just an indication of in your experience that lectins being probably the number one thing to eliminate, maybe it needs to be a little more specific as it goes, but that is the best starting place because the leaky gut is really just a, uh, the, it's the, it's the diagnosis, but it's not necessarily that your food What's sensitivity causing? test can be your, your, your gold, like your, it's not your Bible to what to eat and what not to eat. It's just Correct. saying you have inflammation, you have, your gut is not operating properly. Things are seeping through. And yeah, if you have a diverse diet, you're going to see a lot of stuff on your test and, right. and okay. Interesting. That makes sense because, you know, I mean, in my experience, I had a lot, a lot, a lot of things on my, on my tests that were a level, level, le red level high. Um, okay. You had said that you wanted to talk about vitamin D. Yeah. The so vitamin D, is that a hormone as well? It is a hormone as well. In fact, okay. we should have named it as a hormone long ago instead of a vitamin. But okay. one of the things that I guess didn't surprise me, but maybe surprised me early on when, you know, and I've been working in this area for 25 years now, 
is that all of these patients who presented with autoimmune diseases, uh, just as a start, had very low levels of vitamin D. And, you know, I went, hmm, that's kind of interesting. Um, and then all of these patients with leaky gut have low levels of vitamin D. And so, yeah, you know, so there's, there's several important things. Um, so vitamin D is a hormone. I've never seen vitamin D toxicity uh, yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I've been measuring vitamin D levels every three months for 25 years. Uh, I think a normal vitamin D level should be anywhere from 100 to 150. Uh, even the Cleveland Clinic and Quest now say that vitamin D levels up to 150 are completely normal, not too high. And so I'll push my patients' vitamin D levels up to 100 to 150. Sometimes we'll go higher. Vitamin D does two things. Um, we have, as, as the cells in the wall of our gut are, are hurt by these lectins and other compounds, there's a bunch of replacement cells, stem cells, that are ready to take the place of these damaged cells. It's kind of like the old Revolutionary War movies where you got lots of lines of soldiers <laughs> and the first guys go down and the next guys step up, right? right? Well, that second line has to be pushed into place by vitamin D. They sit there and twiddle their thumbs and go, what, am I supposed to do something? And it's vitamin D that pushes them into place. That's number one. Mm. Number two, we know that people with autoimmune diseases, their immune cells, their white blood cells, normally should be sensitive to vitamin D. Vitamin D basically says, hey, guys, relax. Um, go have a donut and a smoke if we think of them as cops. Um, and that's not to generalize, but just cool it. Don't carry an Uzi around. Every, everything's fine. But we know that people with autoimmune diseases, their immune cells do not listen to vitamin D properly. So you basically have to literally hit them with a sledgehammer to quiet down. So it's this twofold effect. And uh, so almost all human beings should be on 5,000 international units of vitamin D or 125 micrograms. Any of my autoimmune patients, we start them on 10,000 international units. The University of California, San Diego, uh, one of the expert centers in vitamin D, thinks the average American should take 9,600 international units of vitamin D a day to have an adequate level. The average American. They found and other people found that you cannot produce vitamin D toxicity at 40,000 international units a day. You're safe. <laughs> and you're safe. And I have some of my really tough autoimmune patients on 40, 50,000 a day. Um, that because of the bioavailability to their body of what they actually absorb and do something with? Excellent question. It turns out when you've got a leaky gut, you do not absorb it well. And long before we had measurements of leaky gut, I used vitamin D levels to decide when the gut was sealed. And so I'd be pushing, pushing, pushing vitamin D, and I'd have somebody on 30,000 units and, and their vitamin D would be 50. And then on the next blood test, their vitamin D is, you know, 140. And I go, great, you know, we're there. Let's start backing down now. And it, it's actually been a very reliable uh, way. So you're right. People with leaky gut, you just can't absorb vitamin D well. And wow. once we seal you, then your vitamin D needs go down. Got it. That makes perfect sense. What are some other kind of hormones that are at play that are uh, big factors in overall health? Well, um, one of the things that I wrote about in the last book, The Energy Paradox, that I think people need to know is glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, is now omnipresent in our diet. It's in, and people, you know, we, we, 
we learned about Roundup with GMO foods and, mm -hmm. you know, Roundup was developed to, you know, spray soybeans and kill the weeds and the soybeans wouldn't die, blah, blah, blah. And so everybody thinks of Roundup as being sprayed on GMO foods, but, and 95% of corn in the United States is genetically modified, um, same with canola. But now what's happened in the last 10 years is that Roundup is no longer just being used on GMO crops. It's now being used on conventional crops as what's called a desiccant. Uh, these large corporations have to bring these multi-million dollar harvesters to a field on a certain day to be efficient. So rather than wait for the field to ripen and dry, they kill the plants with Roundup and then they die and then they're dry. And so they basically say, okay, you know, field in Iowa number seven is, we're gonna have the harvesters there on X day, spray it with Roundup so we can harvest it. And so nobody's sitting around washing the wheat or the oats or the corn of Roundup afterwards. They, they don't have to declare it. And so it's fed to our animals. It's fed to us. Almost all grains in the United States are contaminated with Roundup. Almost all vineyards in the United States are sprayed with Roundup to keep Mine's them. clean, organic. Yeah. We're organic. Very good. Wine. Bless it's organic. you. Yes. And, uh, you know, and, but yeah. in, Euro in Europe, and it's, you know, it's hard to get uh, organic or biodynamic wine in the United States. And bless you for doing that. Uh, because, uh, you know, most of our wines are contaminated with, with Roundup. Now, why should we worry about that? Well, it turns out that glyphosate is sadly now known to actually cause intestinal permeability, leaky gut, without doing anything else. Mm -hmm. And Roundup is, Roundup was patented as an antibiotic. Glyphosate was patented as an antibiotic. Was it ever administered as an antibiotic first before it became something they sprayed on? Okay, wow. But it's considered an antibiotic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's. It shows what antibiotics do. Exactly. And so one of the things that they assured us was that don't worry, Roundup is not absorbed and it can't kill you because you nice people don't run what's called the shikimate pathway. And that's a really fun word, the shikimate pathway. Sounds and funny. yeah, but, but plants use the shikimate pathway. What they didn't tell us was that our bacteria in our gut use the shikimate pathway. And that's how they patented it as an antibiotic but they didn't bother to tell any of us. So every time you eat a Roundup sprayed grain or bean or corn, you're inadvertently killing off your gut microbiome and causing leaky gut, even though you're very fastidious about you know, what, choosing things. More amazing episodes just like this one, watch now. Everybody's got a juicer. I know you got one in the cabinet someplace. Get out your juicer, buy some organic berries, buy some organic fruit, put it in your juicer, throw the juice away. It's poison.